We've been talking about doctrines which divide Christians. We've talked about several different areas of the life of the church in which divisions have occurred. I want to come today to that topic of uh, churches cooperating in an evangelistic or benevolent work. And the particular question is, can one church collect money locally and pool that together with money collected locally in another area by another church and take those collected funds to a third location, to a third church, for the accomplishment of the work of the church in benevolence or in evangelism. There are several passages of Scripture which are used in this discussion, and we want to turn first to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and the verse is number 3. 1 Corinthians 16, verse number 3, and it says, And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. He's been talking about you take up a collection locally, and uh, hold it until I come, and that's, uh, then this is what he says in verse 3. It is argued that a person from the church in Corinth must necessarily, individually, carry that money himself to the place where it was needed. That supposes facts that are not in evidence. Did Paul, did Paul ever give aid to other people? Did he take that money from Corinth uh, and personally hand it to somebody else who then made the ultimate decision as to how that money should be used? Was that money from Corinth ever mingled with the money carried by other people from other churches? There were several in the context here, uh, Paul tells us, that were traveling with him from other churches and carrying contributions from other churches. In fact, the first two verses of this chapter uh, tell us that, uh, as I've told other churches, even so do you. Here was a person, Paul, not even a member of the local church there in Corinth, who was presuming the authority to send a local Christian from Corinth to carry that support to another place. There's nothing in this passage which necessarily suggests that an individual from the church in Corinth must carry that money and it never be mingled with any other money and that he must uh, directly deliver that to the person uh, specifically in need or the group or whatever. Another passage is in 2 Corinthians, and we'll turn to chapter 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and we're looking at verses 18 and 19. And we have sent with him the brother, whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches, and not that only, but who was also chosen of the churches to travel with us with this grace, which is administered by us to the glory of the same Lord and declaration of your ready mind. It's considerably surprising that this passage should ever be used to suggest or to teach that uh, money from one church could not be mingled with the money from another church, that churches couldn't cooperate in combining funds to send to a, a mission point. This passage teaches exactly the opposite. It is argued here that someone, one individual, carried the contribution directly from the church to the recipient. But the verse teaches precisely the opposite. Let's look at it again. Paul did the sending. Paul said, we have sent with him the brother. Paul did the sending, not the church. And Paul sent one who was chosen not of the church, but of the churches. Several churches together combined in sending this one individual. And there was a pooling of funds, and that pooler here was not even a church or an eldership. It was a single individual, the Apostle Paul. That which was contributed was administered by Paul 
and others, not by the sending church, not even by an eldership on the receiving end. And God was glorified in the process. And so the argument here fails miserably. It simply does not teach that the money sent from a church must go directly to the individual and not through a third party or not be mingled with funds from others along the way. It teaches the opposite. Another passage that is often used in this discussion is Acts chapter 11. And the verses here are 27 through 30. Acts chapter 11 and beginning in verse number 27. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem to Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul." Again, it's surprising that this passage could be used to argue that the church must send money directly to the recipient and not to be handled by somebody else in between. The passage proves, again, the opposite. Notice, every individual determined to send. This was not a unified leadership decision. The relief was sent to the elders. But was that in one church? Or was it in many? It was in Judea, a province, not a city, not a neighborhood. No particular congregation is indicated here. But it was not only the elders who were suffering. This famine was worldwide. It was, as it says, throughout all the world. So who was sending the money to whom? How was it transmitted from one place to the other? And then what became of it afterward? Some of these things aren't specified to us. And to make dogmatic arguments on things not specified is to set oneself up as the authority rather than what is written. And we must be very careful about doing something like that. The relief was intended for the brethren which dwelt in Judea. It wasn't just the city of Jerusalem that was suffering, but people everywhere. And you know, very often, even today in mission work, money will go to a city but the villages and the, and the rural areas, they don't get the help, whether it's coming from a church or, or from a government uh, sent around the world in times of disaster. He was talking about Judea. He wasn't just talking about Jerusalem. So this money was intended to be spread around across a broader area. As logical as any argument based on this passage would be this that the elders in Jerusalem forwarded that relief money to those in outlying areas where that relief was specifically, most urgently needed. Nothing in the passage suggests that they did not send some of that money to other churches. The suggestion by the reference to Judea rather than Jerusalem is that most likely they did. Nothing in the passage suggests how this money was used when it arrived or whether it was used in accord with the wishes of the sending church. Was it sent to needy Christians who were unknown by the sending churches? Would that have been okay? Who handled this money? How was it handled? What was done with it? I'm not trying to make an argument here based upon what the Scripture does not say. That would be wrong. That's what causes much division and uh, frustration in churches today. Most churches that we know in the world today 
are, are built upon half-truths or things which the Bible does not even teach. We're not trying to argue based on what is not written here, but we're pointing out the fact that to say that it must have been done this way is without justification because there are several possibilities of what might have happened along here. And to speculate which one was used without any written authority from God would be false teaching. We don't want to do that. We urge you not to be doing anything like that. Let God speak for himself and don't add to or take away from his words. No man can give a pattern where there is none. We're not trying to suggest a pattern here. We are saying that those who do suggest and require a pattern do so without the authority of God. Pattern is established by what is written, the commands, the examples, and those necessary implications, those logical implications based upon those commands and examples that God has approved. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse number 5, Christians are admonished to follow the instructions that God gave to Moses in the building of the tabernacle. See that you make it according to the pattern that was shown you. If there is no pattern in the scriptures, we cannot make one. The pattern that we have in what we've seen here is they helped. They sent their help. That's the pattern, how they did it specifically what was done and how monies were handled is simply not described to us. In Romans chapter 6, verse number 17, Paul says to the Christians, you have obeyed that form of doctrine in becoming Christians. We have to obey a form, a pattern. It's the same word. <clears throat> the word translated form here is the Greek word tupos, and that's translated pattern in other places means the same thing. You obeyed a form, you obeyed a pattern, you obeyed an outline, a blueprint, if you will. You had to follow the instructions in order to become a Christian. And we must also follow God's pattern in living as Christians, but we must not invent a pattern where there isn't one or squeeze a pattern into what is, what is written there. We must not put words in God's mouth, as it were. Authority is not given for anything where God has not given it, given some sort of a pattern. In Acts chapter 15, verse number 9, Paul says, God put no difference, excuse me, Peter said, that God put no difference between Jew and Gentile. All are saved in the same way. In verse number 24, the elders in Jerusalem said to uh, Christians in other places, we didn't give any such commandment. And therefore, they weren't allowed to make a law out of something that wasn't commanded, instructed by the authority of God vested in the elders and the apostles and the uh, evangelists. In Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 14, in talking about Jesus as our high priest, he didn't come from the tribe of Levi. And all of the priests under the Old Testament law must come from the tribe of Levi. But Jesus is our high priest, and therefore we must be under a different law. And Paul makes that argument by saying, Moses spake nothing of the tribe of Levi producing any, uh, any priests. And so if Jesus is a priest, then we have a different law. So uh, looking for the pattern, they couldn't find a pattern uh, of, a, of a man from the tribe of Judah uh, being a priest. We, we must look for the pattern that God has given and teach and practice what is written, not what some man might think he sees between the lines, as it were. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 7, the Jews asked the apostles, by what power, by what name have you done this? What authority in the word power? What power? By what name have you done Where do you get the teaching? 
that churches cannot combine their funds, work together, pass money from one to another until it reaches the final destination. Where do you get that teaching? It does not come from the New Testament. It isn't there, and we mustn't add it. Let's live according to what is written and enjoy fellowship in Jesus Christ unto our eternal home with God. May he bless you.